and a couple of dreams. And and this one was a dream that left me completely shaken and baffled. I had no idea what this dream was about. Welcome to the program today, folks. We have a very special guest, uh, Cy Gart. Cy has a PhD in uh, biochemistry, I believe. Uh, he is the author of a fantastic book. We'll put that book in the description link. It's called The Work of His Hands. And so just uh, welcome to the show today, uh, Cy. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah. So my understanding now from your book, Cy, uh, you, you weren't brought up in a Christian home. You, your mama didn't grab you by the hand and carry you to Sunday school uh, Sunday morning and take you to the Wednesday night prayer meeting, did she? No. <laughs> Not at all. Well, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and, and how you were brought up in your worldview. Yeah, um, I was about as far from being brought up as, as a Christian as you can be. My my parents were uh, dedicated atheists and anti-theists, which meant that they uh, not only did not believe in God, but they were uh, very hostile to the idea of religion, Christianity in particular. I uh, thought it was an evil uh, idea, and um, they were also communists. They were members of the American Communist Party uh, in the 30s, uh, and they were still very, very uh, in tune with communism when I was growing up. Uh, and so I had a worldview that was about as far as you can get from being a, 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 a follower of Jesus, and, uh, and that was... Um, that's what I, that was the worldview that I adopted for first part of my life, basically, and never thought about changing it. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating read and journey. So just, just take us through just kind of, I know this is a 20, 30 year process there, but so your father was a scientist, you were father, you know, you're a chip off the old block, you're going to follow in his footsteps. So yeah, my father was a, was a chemist. Uh, and he was a very strict materialist. Uh, he didn't, not only did he not believe in God or anything spiritual, he didn't really hold with any, anything like psychology or I don't know, anything that wasn't hard science. And, uh, that seemed fine with me. I, I, uh, started majoring in chemistry actually, but, uh, and got a, a college degree in chemistry. But then I deviated just a tiny bit and, and went into biochemistry for my graduate work, uh, which was, you know, a little bit off <laughs> the, the true path of chemistry. But still, um, it was, you know, I was a, a purely involved with science. Uh, by the time I, I entered graduate school, however, I had already encountered some disturbing things in my undergraduate work in science and chemistry. Uh, one of them was the Schrodinger equation, which is sort of the thing that quantum mechanics is based on. And um, I didn't really think about it much at the time, but it, at some point I began thinking, you know, I, I didn't think much about it while I was studying, but once once that was all over and I was out of college, I started thinking about what all of this strange stuff in modern physics could mean. And one of the things it seemed to mean to me was that materialism is, is not, doesn't work. I mean, you can't use strict materialism and determinism if you're going to think about electrons, uh, you know, being both particles and waves at the same time, or think about the fact that you can never know uh, the mo momentum and the position of an electron at the same time. These are fundamental principles of physical reality that were determined in the beginning of the 20th century that we, we are taught, but we, we're not taught to think about the implications, the philosophical implications of those facts, which are that materialism doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> there's something else going on and, and we don't understand it. We, by we, I mean scientists. And so the first thing that happened to me was that I kind of lost my faith, we'll call it that, in the materialistic worldview, that everything is everything can be reduced to, you know, a few fundamental laws, and that explains everything. Uh, there's a lot of probability in reality, is what 
quantum mechanics tells us and uh, and the laws of chemistry. So, um, you know, with that, I started learning biochemistry and that was another shock because when you start to learn, and this is many, many decades ago, but it's even more, it even became more true as time passed on. And when you start to learn the details of how life works, it's a shock. I mean, it's just incredible. And uh, it, it's very hard to explain it because it's so technical. It requires a lot of background. And one of the one of the things I try to do in the book, and I'm trying even more in another book that, that, is, that I'm working on is almost ready to, to come out. I'm working on the edits from the publisher at the moment. And what I try to do is convey some feel without going into too much technical detail, which would be impossible to follow, of the enormous chemical complexity that goes on in life that isn't seen anywhere outside of life it just doesn't exist anywhere else not not even close and then and you have to start to wonder well where how did all this come from where, where did you where did we get living cells and you know the, there is a standard answer to that which i accepted completely uh and that is evolution evolution is the you know, the central um, dogma, I guess you could say, the central theory of biology these days. And and I think that evolution is a, is a good theory for um, the diversity of life, but it's generally acknowledged that it cannot explain the, the, the beginnings of life, the origin of life. It can't explain the origins of these amazingly complex systems, which, which by the way, make any kind of machinery from an airplane to a factory look like child's play. Yeah. And all of this is going on a tiny, teeny little cell with molecules that interact with each other and behave in ways that are just astonishing. Uh, and, and there's so many systems like that in, in the biological world. So that got me thinking, okay, all right, so there's something missing here. We, we, we don't know what's going on. And at the same time, in a whole different path, I was thinking more philosophically about, you know, the meaning of life. I was a young man. I was surrounded by a lot of spiritual movements, uh, which in those days in the 1970s included a lot of things like uh, Eastern religions and a revival of Christianity and in, in, in the Jesus movement, which I didn't have anything to do with, but I heard about it. And 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 new age type of things started. I sort of think about all this stuff, and none of it really, really got to me much. Uh, but eventually, as time went on, um, I started thinking about the possibility of God, and thinking maybe it's not impossible that there is a God, simply because there's so many things I'm learning in science that seem impossible. Why, why should the existence of a deity be any more impossible than, you know, protein synthesis by a genetic code? I mean, that's also impossible. Uh, so I became what I guess one would call an agnostic. I, I decided I couldn't call myself an atheist anymore. I, I didn't know that there was no God. Um, but I certainly didn't believe there was. I just didn't know. And I stayed that way for quite some time. At some point, uh, I was brought to a church by a friend uh, who was a Christian. I was, I've said this many times already, but I was absolutely terrified. I'd never crossed the threshold of a house of worship before. <laughs> I didn't, and this is a Catholic church, so I assumed, oh my God, this would be terrible. You know, I, I, I don't know what I imagined you know <laughs> people ready with with uh, fire to burn me at the stake or something I, I you know I, I had heard so much stuff that wasn't true and I didn't know it wasn't true and I was I was totally surprised by what happened uh, the priest gave a wonderful sermon uh, about love and nothing bad nothing about how sinners like me are going to burn in a lake of eternal fire i mean that's what i expected i didn't hear it and it was nice you know i liked it people gave each other the sign of peace uh i liked that um it was actually quite moving and so i went back a couple more times and um it wasn't a fluke it was it was nice 
And, and then I decided, okay, I guess it's time to read something. Maybe I'll take a look at these gospels everybody keeps talking about. And um, I had looked at the Bible before and was totally unimpressed. I, I didn't like the Old Testament very much. I didn't understand any of it, I, what's going on. But I read the book of Matthew, it was the first, first one of the Gospels, and I was just blown away by that, uh, the Sermon on the Mount and, and so, much, so much else. And, and then I skipped to the book of Acts for some reason, which I don't remember, and I found that also um, very convincing as a historical story. Uh, it didn't read like somebody had made that up. It just right. it it didn't sound like fiction. It sounded it might have been distorted. It might have been you know several different people. It might not have been absolutely. But this was telling the story of some real people who who had real experiences and, and in great detail. I mean, Luke is is an amazing writer. Uh, I, eventually, I read the Gospel of Luke, and you know, it's it's it covers so much. So at that point. I um, I started really thinking harder, but even before that happened, I had had some dreams, which I talk about in the book. Yeah, I think those dreams played a, an important part. I mean, you were, I, I think when you were re even reading the Gospels of Matthew and Acts, you were st still uh, an atheist, correct? Yeah, I, I would say I was an agnostic, but I had the first dream when I was when I was still an atheist. It was a long time ago. And it was it was one of several calls from God that I experienced but didn't recognize in my life. First one I was sixteen and and a couple and a couple of dreams and and this one was a dream that left me completely shaken and baffled. I had no idea what this dream was about. And this is the one where I was uh, hanging on a, on a cliff and and afraid I was going to fall. And I was holding on to dear life, and I heard a voice say, just let go. And I, that didn't make any sense to me, and, but I was I didn't know what to do. I was about to fall anyway, so I decided, okay, I, I just said it again, and I did. I let go. And at the same instant that I let go, the world turned 90 degrees, and I was lying on the ground, perfectly safe. And there was a man standing there, and that was the man who had said, just let go. I didn't know what that meant. I had no idea. I, I thought... Let go of what? What is this about? Did Did you think this man was was Jesus at the time? At the time, no, no. no. Um, I never would have thought of that. I I wouldn't even have known how to picture Jesus. <laughs> I don't. I might have seen a few photos here and there uh, purporting to be Jesus, but I never paid any attention to him. Yeah. So I just, I just forgot. I didn't actually forget about the dream because it was very powerful, but I I didn't think about it much. And uh, then as things progressed and I'd gone to church, looked at the Gospels, I, I had a dream where I was walking around the garden and uh, it was a walled garden. So I couldn't see in and I couldn't get over. It was a very high wall. I kept trying to climb up the wall so I could get into this garden and I couldn't do it. Too too steep, too slippery. And I, I, so I just was walking around it. And at some point I saw a man standing there and he said, what are you trying to do? And I said, I'm trying to get inside. He said, well, there's the door. I went through the door. And uh, I did. And um, by that time, I knew what that was. I knew that that was Jesus. And then I thought about it. I realized that first dream was the same thing. And And then I knew what I had to let go of also, because I had this incredible resistance to thinking about God as real. I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. is the upbringing I'd had. The, the, it, one of the thoughts I had was that's too good to be true. I mean, the world is a horrible, dreadful, dark, black, terrible place. There is no good. There is no light. It's just you just try to get by, try to survive, you know, the best you can. And then you die and that's it. And that feeling was so strong that I, I, I couldn't go any, I couldn't get anywhere. I, I was really stuck and I was... I had all this baggage that I had to let go of and it was very difficult to do. So I've, again, after those two dreams and after going to church and after reading some of the gospel and, and thinking about it and thinking, gee, you know, I, 
I started envying people who could believe. <laughs> mm -hmm. I started thinking, I wish I could. Yeah. Couldn't do it. And um, and that's when the Holy Spirit had mercy on me and pulled me over. I couldn't do it by myself. And that story is also in the book. I haven't told it very often, uh, but I was driving my car in my car uh, on an intercity trip. So it was a six hour trip between I think, New York and Pittsburgh. And um, I was listening to the radio. as I always do when I'm driving alone. And I heard a Christian preacher. This was in central Pennsylvania. And I was listening a little bit, wasn't paying much attention, but I noticed that this guy had a great speaking style. I mean, he was a preacher and you know, yeah. you know how preachers can do, right? I mean, they, yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'd stopped listening. I turned it off. But in my mind, I was thinking, what would I, what would I say if I preached? It just came to me as a question. What would I say? And I thought, well, I'll say something about biology and the origin of life and the complexity of biochemistry. And, and then I was driving and something told me to pull over and I did. And I kind of closed my eyes and words just came to me. It was a sermon. It just came to me. I have told this a few times, but it's never easy. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, the sermon I preached was, I could see myself outside talking to a group of people. And I was preaching to them. They were all Christians. And I was telling them that God loved them, that Jesus Christ loved them. Because, and I knew that because I knew that he loved even me. And if, if he could love even me, who could he not love? And that was the basis of the sermon. Yeah. And I just broke down and cried and I said out loud, I believe. And that was it. That was it. I was a Christian from then on. So when you, you became a Christian, uh, obviously you, you got you gave up your childish ways of evolution. <laughs> well, I gave up my atheism. Uh, I started. I wouldn't say I gave up evolution. I, in fact, I have not. But I have looked at it very carefully, sure, and uh, come up with uh, a number of ideas. And, and this is not just me. I, I, there's a whole crowd of Christian folks who think of evolution as God's handiwork. And I think that that's true in many cases. Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah, I think that, uh, but I was, but I, the interesting thing, Ken, is I, I was worried about that when I, when I almost immediately, as soon as I knew that I was a believer, that Jesus Christ was real and he was my savior and I knew it and it, it, it was a certainty. Uh, I got worried because I didn't know any other Christians in the sciences. I didn't know a single one. I had heard of Francis Collins, who, you know, had, was a famous guy. This is before he became NIH director, but he was famous in science. And everybody knew he was a Christian. I, I didn't know anyone else. <laughs> and it turns out there are thousands of others, most of whom I now know. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, then I learned that that all the original scientists were Christians and many of them very, very devout. And I think I have a whole list in the book of, of you know, the scientists who are devout Christians and, and there's no contradiction between science and Christianity at all. In fact, up until the end of the 19th century, nobody ever thought of a conflict between the two. And now of course it's everywhere. And, and that's my main motivation for for being with you, for writing books, for doing everything I do is to convince anyone who will listen or read that this is the worst myth. And sometimes I call it Satan's worst lie that science and Christianity are opposed to each other. They're not. Science is not atheistic. There's nothing in common with atheism. And uh, the more we learn in science, the more we see pointers to the real God. The true God, who you know, we we see and we worship in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and, uh, 
that's that's the reality that's the truth and it, it there's no conflict with with science yeah so while a lot of people are deconstructing their faith these days it's kind of a, a thing to do with some of these celebrity christians you were actually through the study of science you were de deconstructing your atheism exactly the more you learned the more the foundations begin to crack as you begin to look at what uh you know quantum theory quantum mechanics the uh, observer effect uh, different things like that mm -hmm. and yeah i mean and what's very interesting to me now is <laughs> among atheists you know people say well christians you know they, they deny science right well there's science denialism going on very strongly among the atheist community now. For example, I'll give you one example. There's a there's a very common meme that you will see in atheism is that the genetic code is not really a code. Mm -hmm. And they say that because usually if there's a code, it means there's someone who coded, there's a coder. And so what they want to do is avoid the idea that there can be a coder. So they deny that the genetic code is actually a code, which I find astonishing. I mean, Richard Dawkins finds that idea absurd. <laughs> he's an atheist, but he's also a biologist, and he knows that's nonsense. And uh, I've had some amazing interactions with both atheists and uh, atheist scientists and atheists who are not scientists. And the non-scientists jump on this all the time. And the scientists are, are, are you know, dismayed <laughs> that this has become a, a bedrock of atheism and it's total science denialism. And there are other examples. Uh, people are now, you, you hear people saying, well, the universe is actually past and eternal. Uh, the Big Bang was only one of several um, origins of reality. That that's made up, you know. That there's a few few nutcases in physics, pardon my language, who uh, who who hold to that theory. But it's it's not it's not a, a, a at all a consensus theory among real physicists. It's uh, it's a it's a crackpot idea, and you know that. The point is that science used to believe when I was a kid that this, the universe was steady state and it had always been here and it was no beginning. And then it turned out there was a beginning, just as the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's a scientifically true statement. And uh, that makes atheists upset. And I, I I remember as an atheist being very upset at things that you know seem to be, go against against my belief system, and and so they deny it. They denying the the reality of the origin of the universe, the reality of of the genetic code. And you know, whenever I say uh, from science, I, I I'm doing my own research. In I mean, real science research, not just looking things up on the internet. But I'm doing some uh, statistical and mathematical uh, studies on the origin of life. And, you know, they don't like what I'm finding either because it, sug it suggests that the origin of life uh, requires something in addition to what we now know as the laws of chemistry and physics. And uh, it needs, it probably needs uh, some new laws. And those laws are going to point to God, just like all the current laws do. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at gravity what is gravity it says that objects attract each other okay through maybe through particles called gravitons or whatever follows the general law of relativity but none of that says where it comes from or how do you get the law of gravity it's just there <laughs> and, it, and it's a very specific law that can be written very easily mathematically which also doesn't make any sense. Why should it be so easy? Why should it be so simple? Yeah. I mean, I my answer is, yeah, God created the law, all the laws when he created the universe. And thank you, Lord, for making it so easy for us stupid humans to understand. Yeah. Well, speak to the fact that I know um, a lot of Christians, when they hear the term evolution, they tend to think, oh my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. look out. 
So kind of walk, walk through that just briefly about how a Christian can maintain the scientific uh, viewpoint of, of evolution and still maintain their faith and not feel like, oh, you know, if I believe in evolution and I don't, I think maybe some of them don't have a proper understanding of evolution to begin with. I really liked your video of what evolution is not. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that really kind of separates it out a lot. You know, it's like, you know, we're not going to have, uh, you know, zebras turning into cows and right. so forth. Um, yeah, I think that, I think what you just said is, is the key. Uh, a lot of people who really don't like evolution, what they don't like is not evolution. <laughs> it's something that they think is part of it and it's not. And, um, you know, I've heard people say things like, well, I don't, uh, I don't, believe i don't know something about astrophysics and it's and and then they they lump that in with evolution and you know it's just it's not the same evolution is a biological theory which is actually quite limited it only applies to biology so you can't say evolution is you know why we're sitting here talking on this remote amazing technical uh, invention of Zoom and the internet and computers. Yeah, all of those things developed and changed and in some ways they evolved, but the mechanism of, of, of their evolution is totally different from the biological mechanism. The biological mechanism of evolution requires several things. And one of the things it requires is a very accurate uh, reproduction of cells. You can't just have a cell divide in two. Yet the, the two divided cells have to be almost identical to the parent cell. If you don't have that, you can't get evolution working because evolution depends on natural selection, which goes over generations. So let's say you have a bird, okay, who, who has a mutation and gets better eyesight. So natural selection will say it sees better, it hunts better, it lives better, it survives, it has more kids. But if those kids don't inherit that same mutation, there's no evolution going on. So you have to have a very accurate reproductive system, a very accurate self-replication system. And how do you get that? You get that. You can't get that by evolution because you need that to have evolution. So how do you get it? And the accurate self-replication system is one of those amazingly complicated, difficult, chemical, mechanistic, uh, uh, mechanical, whatever you want to call it, uh, systems that we can't explain its origin for. We can't explain the origin of the genetic code. We can't explain the origin of the very complex ways that cells convert sunlight into energy, which is re unbelievably remarkable. And it also involves quantum mechanics. It involves, oh my goodness, uh, chemical pathways that are, are I mean, they're just, graduate students, including myself, usually fail those exam <laughs> questions because it's so difficult. And um, where did all that come from? You know, that, that it can't come from evolution. That's what you need to get evolution started. Now, once you have that and evolution gets started, then it's fairly trivial. And the interesting thing is that every, you know, people say Christians don't believe in evolution, but every Christian does including the members of the Answers of Genesis, the, one of the premier young earth creationist groups. If you look at, if you look at the museum, uh, at, the, at the Museum of the Ark, uh, they have exhibits showing the, the, the various kinds that were on the Ark. And so there's a cat kind and a bear kind and a dog kind, you know, various kinds. But those kinds, then after the Ark, stopped they got off the ark and evolved into lions tigers pussy cats and everything else that's a cat and and this is what answers in genesis says so 
they don't deny the possibility of evolution. They just they just limit it from one level to to the to the lower levels. They don't go further up. So okay, fine, but they acknowledge the mechanism of evolution, natural selection. Okay, now the difference between answers in Genesis, young earth creationism, and people like me, evolutionary creationists, or even many of the intelligent design and, and the old earth creationist people, is that we go further. We go from not just, we say cats and dogs were once, you know, related in some way from a, with a common ancestor that we don't know who it was. And, and so are bears. And so, you know, and then you, you just keep going up and eventually everything meets. Now, is that a fact? We have lots of evidence for that, but still it's, you know, it's it's a very good theory with lots of evidence, no evidence against it scientifically. And so it's it's a it's a robust, it's a robust theory, but it does have missing holes in it. And it's not just the origin of life. There are other areas where it's not quite clear how these varieties appeared. But, you know, that's why I like to say that evolution is a great theory, but it's not complete because there are some aspects of biology that are not covered by it. And so we need to look further. And I believe, as a matter of personal belief, that the elimination of many uh, areas of biology by uh, diehard materialists over the last century or more uh have hurt the science of biology that when they say you can't have any purpose you can't have any teleology or any agency everything just happens by random chance there's no there's no will well you know look at a worm a worm does things it wants to do <laughs> a worm has a purpose which is to survive and it and it acts and so does every other living organism including single cells bacteria so deny that, but again, you're denying reality. And and where does that come from? Where does where does this teleology, where does this purpose and and ability to act, where does that come from? That 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 doesn't just appear from the laws of physics. <laughs> I mean, you know, nothing outside of biology does anything on purpose. It just happens. You know, you get a fire, you get a volcano, you get whatever. But living things decide to do such stuff, and they do it. Like us, we're living things. We have a lot of purpose and a lot of agency. Look at all the things we've done. So anyway, I'm getting a little far afield, but my 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 bottom line point is, if you understand what evolution really is, it says nothing against the existence of God or you know the 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 worship of Jesus. Nothing. Is it consonant with the Bible? What I like to say is. The Bible and scientific theories like evolution are not uh, saying the same thing, but they're in harmony. And you know what harmony is, because I see all those guitars. You know that harmony means you're not playing the same notes, but what ends up coming out is beautiful music. And that's how I deal with the Bible and what I know about science. It's, it's in harmony. So just to give you some examples, what does the Bible say about life? It says everything gives according to its kind. Okay. So in other words, cows only give birth to cows, dogs to dogs. That is a crucial principle of evolution. If that were not true, you couldn't have evolution. It's, I, I had a debate with Ken Hovind once and Ken Hovind and, and he was telling me, I never saw a pineapple give birth to a dog. And, you know, I I tried to tell him, right, you're correct. <laughs> you're not going to. <laughs> you're never going to. And that's that's an I that's an argument for evolution, not against it, because you need that. What else does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us tells us that life didn't come all at once. It came in stages and it started, you know, early with plants and then went to birds and fish and then eventually finally humans. And that's roughly what we think of in evolution. And, you know, there are many other ancient myths which don't say that at all. They say what they say is life started with some animal or a god and then they made humans and then humans did something else. But the, the biblical account 
is about as close to the scientific reality and very close to what they knew of the science at the time as as any anything else written uh 2000 years or more uh, ago can be so uh, you know did it all happen in 7 days i don't think so but i don't think i think there's a lot in the bible that we don't have to take exactly literally as you know, in terms of numbers and things like that. I, and, if we, and if we and nobody does, by the way. I mean, uh, I asked a young earth creationist once about, you know, the question of incest and the children of Adam and Eve. And the answer was very interesting, but it was an interpretation. Sure. Yeah, it wasn't the literal reading of what's in Genesis. It was an interpretation of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. So I think we we are certainly uh, entitled, as everyone does, to interpret the Bible. We don't have to agree that every literal word is correct. We can still accept the Bible as inerrant, the inerrant word of God as transmitted to human beings. And with all that, we can still accept modern science, which, by the way, is going to continually change, as it always has. So that, you know, and, and what I like to say is there's only one truth. And that truth is has to be both scientific and you know religious. And the Bible does not change, but science does all the time. And I gave one example earlier about the Big Bang, you know, the beginning of the universe. It turns out, well, that yeah, that was where the Bible got it right, and we didn't. We scientists didn't. And sometimes we have to change our interpretations of scripture. And sometimes we have to do more experiments in science. But I believe firmly that in the end, there is only one truth. And both the two books of God, the book of words and the book of works, will give us the same truth. You touched uh, earlier, you mentioned ID. And I, I really enjoyed that section of the book uh, about intelligent design. Yeah. And so I know you kind of have a different take on that a little bit. So uh, kind of share with us your opinion on that and, and where they may fall and where you may fall in with that. Yeah. Well, you know, intelligent design, I mean, it, it, people often say there's two ways to talk about it. If you're not writing, one is with capital letters and one is with small letters. <laughs> okay. So capital letters, intelligent design is a movement and, a, and an institute and, you know, uh, some very smart people there. I, I know some of them. Um, lowercase, lowercase intelligent design is just the idea that, that there's design in the universe. But I don't like to call it intelligent. I like to call it divine. And the reason is intelligent sounds like, you know, a smart person, you know, some brilliant, I don't know, scientist, mathematician, you know, we can all think of these people. God is way beyond that. God is not intelligent. He's just, uh, there's no word for the nature of God except divine. And the design that we see in, in nature, the design that we see in life is way beyond human intelligence. That's why we cannot mimic it. We cannot produce life. There's no way. We know everything that's there but we cannot reconstruct it and make a living cell can't be done mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how smart you are or how many smart people you have together in the room you cannot do the things that god did and that applies to so many things in nature i mean it applies to the stars and i i mean i'm a biologist so i know the biology but you'll hear the same thing from hugh ross who's an astrophysicist and and other people who are, you know, have other specialties. It, the nature is just amazing, and it's designed, and it's designed by God. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that doesn't that doesn't negate any of the scientific laws, all of the scientific realities. You know, it, it, they're all there, and they're all right. And this is how God created, but we could never do that. So I like divine design. I think it's a better term. I love that term. Yeah. So often in our culture, it seems like we we pit God against science. I remember seeing a, a I, I think it was a Time magazine article, uh, you know, it's a boxing ring and, you know, you've got God in one corner, yeah. you've got <laughs> science in the other corner, and they're 
coming out and they're going to fight and blows and, you know, science is going to triumph over God. And, uh, you know, you see kids going off to university that may have faith and, um, it seems like the scientists and I've had some on the channel, the teachers that are teaching different programs, um, you know, it's like a battle and, um, you know, science is always going to triumph over, uh, over God and faith and religion. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's like I said before, this is, this is the, the myth that I'm battling and I'm not alone. There are, there are quite a few of us doing this. Um, quite a few good books have come out yeah. to try to dispute this, this horrendous myth. Uh, which is very destructive. It's as you it's destructive to our young people, our students, and you know, people. As you said, people are deconstructing all the time for various reasons. But one of them should not never be science. I mean, it, and and you know, the 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 original scientists, and you don't have to go too far back. Even the nineteenth century, people like uh, Michael Faraday and and James Clerk Maxwell and Louis Pasteur and these were all deeply religious men. And if they were here today and saw this battle, they would be astonished. They would, we wouldn't understand it. It never would have occurred to them that there's anything about, these are all founders of major fields of science and they wouldn't get it. They, they would say, what, why, why is this, crazy idea so popular <laughs> and, you know and and it's it's hard to answer that question i don't know the answer it's like it's like the mainstream media has hijacked the narrative yeah yeah and i don't know you know i, I mean it, it's so strange i was once at a at a meeting actually it was, a, it was a meeting of it was a seminar given by a physicist to the public and uh, I was listening to, he was quite good. He said a lot of things. And somebody in the audience raised a question, which I don't remember, but during asking the question, he, he said, um, I'm a Christian and I'm also a PhD student in physics. And the speaker said, really? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, what do you mean really i mean <laughs> yeah. and he was he was genuinely astonished and later i happened to know the person who asked the question so i was standing with him later and the speaker came over and he really didn't couldn't get it he didn't know anyone else who wow. he said who was who was a christian and i said you know what that's what i used to think in academia. When I became a Christian, I thought I was the only one in my department and I was the only one in, in the university. And then I found out, guess what? There were a lot of others who were keeping quiet about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when I hear people say, oh, Christians are always, are always oppressing uh, atheism and you know, trying to exert their will uh, over, over the society, I like to answer, well, not in academia. There, it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's 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 very unfortunate. I hope the tide will change, but it's going to require a lot more people who know the truth to start to keep speaking out and publicly write books, give us give give interviews, and speak. Mm -hmm. And convince everyone. You know, I don't say I don't say to people who are who are skeptics, you should you must come to faith. I th I think the Holy Spirit has to help them come to yes. faith, but mm -hmm. at least try to convince them that you know it, their atheism has nothing to do with science. It should not have anything to do with science. If they if they don't like the idea of a god, if they don't like the idea of the Bible, whatever. Okay, fine. That's another issue, but don't use science as an excuse. That that's simply wrong. Mm -hmm. What when you uh, surrendered and became a Christian? What was the reaction of uh, your family members or people that were close, your colleagues at work? Uh, how, how did they react to that? Did they think you were having a breakdown, or did they? Uh, it, it's a great question because 
I kept it quiet too. Okay. For a long time. I kept it very quiet. I, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know, should I go to church? How do I go to church? I mean, do, do I just walk in? <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know anything. And, and uh, I didn't tell very many people. I did tell one or two people who were close to me who accepted it. Yeah. Um, it was difficult. It really was. It was. Um, it was a complete worldview change for you. I mean, you, yeah. You know, you're talking about, I mean, we're talking about it over, you know, 30, 45 minutes, but this is what, 20 years or. Yeah. A year? long time in the making. And, and just to flip that switch mentally and spiritually. The switch really flipped after all waiting all that time. And, and, and I knew it was, I knew the switch was flipped. I knew I wasn't going back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine that um occasionally people will say to me oh eventually you'll you'll see the arrows of your ways and go back and yeah no 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 <laughs> you know that what's the biblical verse of, of people walking in darkness have seen a great light right and and i saw the great light and you don't go back into darkness once you see the light <laughs> so i don't know i i feel um that it was unfortunate that I, 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 so I felt very isolated and, uh, but it was my own isolation. I just didn't know who to tell, what to say, what to do. And eventually I was very fortunate to find a group of, um, a large organization actually called the American Scientific Affiliation, which is a, an organization of scientists uh, who are Christians. And I went to one of their meetings. This was in 2010, so it's about 12 years ago. And uh, I met a lot of people, and I was just overwhelmed uh, by the whole experience. And at some point, I eventually got myself to a church. I joined the church, started going regularly. I don't think I've missed a Sunday since. Well, maybe one or two. I actually became, it's a Methodist church. I became the lay leader for about five years, too. And... Uh, and, you know, that made a huge difference. I mean, I didn't know what the role of church was in a Christian's life. I had no idea. And I found out it's really important. <laughs> you know, it's it's so important to, to have that connection with others. I mean, it's the body of Christ. It's not just one person yeah. walking around. So I kept learning. I mean, that wasn't the end of my journey. Uh, I had to keep, you know, moving forward and and then, you know, I wrote this book and I've done some interviews and, uh, you know, that's, that's where I am now. I'm mm -hmm. trying to spread the word. Yeah. So, um, when you look at the evolution, the process creation, but when it comes to man, uh, yeah. the, image, the image of God, yeah. and man, man is created in the image of God. Uh, share with us, uh, some of your scientific thoughts or, right uh, scriptural thoughts on that yeah i mean what i like to say about evolution is it doesn't do much for the beginning of life and it doesn't do much for the end and the end being us <laughs> um why do i say that well i'm not denying that human beings are primates that we have common ancestors with chimps and gorillas that our bodies are animalistic you know we have all the all the genes and all not all many of the genes and all the structures that other animals have but that's not what makes us human that just makes us walking around you know naked apes as the phrase <laughs> what makes us human well our souls now you may say so i don't believe in a soul well okay say how about consciousness the fact that we're conscious, the fact that we have minds that can do amazing things and no other animal can even dream of doing. I, I know animals do a lot of great things, but I, I haven't yet uh, seen any other really smart chimp or porpoise or any other kind of animal on a Zoom show. You know, they haven't quite gotten there yet. 
And uh, nor have I seen any of them do any poetry or paint any pictures. Uh, actually, that's not true. I've seen chimps paint pictures, but that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> They're not pictures you would take home and put on your wall. But anyway, um, so yeah, so the the essence of who we are is not explainable by natural selection. There's no there's no selective advantage, which is what drives everything else in evolution. There's no selective advantage to being artistic or conscious or any of that. If you think about it, the, the if you had a group of people who were barely conscious, but basically just, you know, lived as well as they could. And then you had a bunch of dreamers who thought about poetry all day and didn't bother going hunting. Who would have who would who would be, you know, who would do better? <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's where evolution fails, and and we and where do we go from there? Well, if you don't think of the answer as being God, made in the image of God, I don't know what the alternative answer is. I, I don't know of a scientific. I mean, science can't even explain what consciousness is. Never mind how we got it. Yeah. So it's you know, will they ever get there? I doubt it. But the, my point is that. If you define human beings the way I just did, which is, you know, a, a really incredibly exceptional uh, type of creature that can do things that no other creature can do, uh, including worship God, um, you, you've got to come to the conclusion that, yeah, we're we're exceptional. And, and by the way, and this goes along with what I've been saying before, who denies human exceptional, exceptionalism these days? It's it's the atheists who say there's nothing special about you. You're just a, a same blob of protoplasm as every other animal. And yeah, you you have hands that can move, <laughs> you can talk, but so what? That's mine. Well, you know, in the old days, humanism was a form of atheism, which said that humans are are really special and they don't need God, so they're atheists. But the modern atheists won't even say that humans are special. They just say we're we're just products of evolution like everybody else, and no better than squids or you know mollusks or whatever. And that's just nonsense. It's just it's denial of reality. Now, I'm not putting down animals. I think there are great animals. Dogs are great. And, you know, other animals are great. But we're exceptional, and we, it's because we're made in the image of God. So. What I like to say is, yeah, we have our bodies, which are products of evolution, but that's not who we are. Who we are is uh, bearers of God's image mm -hmm. and, and all of that implies morality, uh, doing good, you know, and when Jesus came to earth, when God came to earth in the form of Jesus, what did God tell us? He didn't tell us any science. He could have. Yeah, he could have said, oh, let me explain thermodynamics to you. <laughs> Didn't do that. He told us about how to love each other, mm -hmm. about how to be good people, how to treat everyone as a worthwhile human being. That was that was his message. And his, some of his message was still not getting very well. <laughs> we're not we're not following very well, but you know, we try. <laughs> And, and we know we're going to keep sinning and falling back because we do have this animal nature. You could call it the fall, or you could call it, you know, the, the original sin, or you could call it the fact that we evolved from animals. But either way, we have these two natures. We have the, the nature of sin, and we have the nature of grace, and that comes from God. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I, I really dug uh, about your book, their size, uh... Let me get that in here. The, the work of his hands, and it's a it's a great uh, read, folks. Uh, I think you know we could talk for another hour or two about uh, the contents of that book. I know there's some great fables in there, and some other things that you'll find fascinating. But I would encourage anyone to pick up the book who's you know atheist, Christian, uh, you know someone who's looking into this, college students, uh, you know looking into evolution, and so. I think Sai really uh, very scientifically points us by his study. And again, it's a gradual process how he 
came from atheism to slowly that was destroyed with his research to agnosticism and eventually to come to faith in Christ. A fantastic read. Uh, I'll be giving it to my friends and so forth. So thanks for writing the book, Cy. I appreciate well, it. Well, thanks for your kind comments about it. I appreciate it. I am, I am, as I mentioned, I'm in the process of getting a second one ready to come out. And it's also on science and faith, it's different in tone and style a little bit, but uh, hopefully it'll It'll strike a chord with people as well. I'm sure it will. We'll have you back on when, when that uh, when that book drops. Oh, but be great. Um, I know you're involved with some with some different organizations. The um, the ASA. I think you're involved with is it Biogenesis or BioLogos. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so maybe talk a little bit about those, and I can maybe just talk about that because you know you were kind of like Elijah. You thought you were just out here, the lone ranger <laughs> out here. I, uh, all alone you know I'm, I'm the only one left got them uh, you know yeah, yeah but there there actually are some uh, you know strong organizations as you mentioned so uh, speak a little bit about each one of those for a few minutes sure um yeah the asa is the main one i'm involved with uh the asa puts out a quarterly online magazine called god and nature and i'm the editor-in-chief of that um and we publish essays poetry photography or anything related to uh, to nature and, and, and in a Christian sense. Uh, so people are, should feel welcome to look that up. Uh, it's part of the ASA, the American Scientific Affiliation. It's also an academic journal that they put out, but uh, I sometimes publish there, but I, I'm not involved. Oh, actually I am, I'm on the board of, <laughs> I just put on the board of edit, editorial board of that. So. That's that's but that's for scholarly uh, publications. Um, and the ASA has local chapters. So wherever you are, you can look to see if there's one near you. I happen to be uh, vice president of the uh, Metropolitan um, Washington, D.C. area chapter. And it, it's a great organization. We have annual meetings every summer. Uh, lots of good science good religion wonderful worship music and things and and um a lot of fellowship uh so look into the look into that uh the other organization you mentioned biologos i'm not really officially part of i have published uh, uh essays there and i've given a, a an interview with their podcast uh, called um, the language of God. Uh, the Biologos group is very strongly um, evolutionary creationist in their view. They they hold to evolution as true. Uh, the ASA has no particular position on the scientific issues related to faith. They ha they include anyone uh, from young Earth creationism to evolutionary creationism but it is a Christian organization. Now, the other, there are several other organizations, um, Reasons to Believe, mm -hmm. which is a old earth creationist group, uh, is kind of in between intelligent design and evolutionary creationism, I would say. I've done a number of interviews with their current uh, um, director, uh, Bazalrana, Bazrana, uh, who took over from Hugh Ross, who founded that organization. And Fuzz and I have a great time because uh, we don't agree on everything, but we agree on a lot of things. And we're both biochemists, so that's great because we can <laughs> we can speak the same language easily. And we have to be careful because no one else will understand what we're saying. But um, but we've had some good some good talks, and uh, you know. Uh, they don't reject evolution. They accept it to some extent, but they have a lot of questions about it. And all of these organizations have, are what we would call big tents. So they, they are people, you know, it's not one dogmatic view. There's lots of different viewpoints. And so there's a lot of overlap. And as I said, I know, I know people in the ID movement, intelligent design movement, and 
I, some of them I really don't agree with at all. They they completely deny the possibility of evolution. I think they're wrong, but others are quite the opposite. They will actually accept evolution, but they also point out its its limitations, which is legitimate. So again, that's that's somewhat to the other side of reasons to believe. It, it, it's um, There are people there who are young Earth creationists, some are old Earth creationists. Uh, what they have in common is this belief that design is the key thing to look at in the world. Uh, and then on the other side of them, we have the Young Earth Creationists, and there are a couple of organizations, uh, Answers in Genesis, and um, uh, the, the um, Institute of Creation Research, which don't always agree on everything, but they're both Young Earth groups. And and I have friends who are young Earth creationists, and uh, you know they're scientists, um, philosophers, very intelligent people. Um, I have friends in all of these organizations, and my own view is the, the disagreements that we do have are trivial and minor compared to the agreements that we have, which is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. To me, that's the bedrock. Yeah. And the rest is shifting sands. And um, you know, we'll we'll know the truth someday. I'll I'll find out the truth. I'll get it directly from, you know, from the words of Jesus directly in my face <laughs> when I get to meet him. And um whenever I say that, I say, but not quite yet. <laughs> um so you know, I, I'm a great proponent of Christian fellowship, regardless of denomination, regardless of scientific um, uh, belief systems. Uh, and, and I know people who have switched from one to another and gone back and forth, and I think that all that is fine. You know, we that's what we do. We're human beings. We talk, we argue, we think, we discuss, and we come to truth. Any parting words you want to leave us about your book? Well, I think you said a lot, and uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I think if you if you read the book, you you will see that many things that you might have thought were impossible are really possible. If someone like me, who was you know about as far as you could possibly be from being a follower of Jesus could get there. There isn't anyone who can't. So if you or someone you love or someone you know is you see them on the path that's leading in the wrong direction, don't despair. You can help them. Depending on what the situation is, maybe my book will help them. But who will really help them is the spirit. God is is active we see that this revival that we just saw in, in asbury college i think makes it very clear not only is god not dead <laughs> he's he's not ill and he's active and he's working and and just watching the faces of those kids and everyone else there i don't know how anyone could deny the reality and the power of the holy spirit it's so obvious. And uh, so ha keep keep hope. Ha keep the faith and have hope. You know, there's an answer. And you can provide the answer. Somebody else can provide the answer. But eventually, the Holy Spirit will provide the answer. And, you know, all will be well. That's why we, we hold to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, because he is. Hmm. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us in your journey and um, look forward to the new book and uh, God bless you. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin.